Love. This is a first for us. For the very first time, we recorded an episode of Why Dance Matters in front of a live audience. And my tiny, pandemic-squeezed brain can barely deal. We recorded the Royal Academy of Dance podcast at the Royal Academy of Dance in its new global headquarters in London and in its warm, elegant, Odie Ebsen Studio Theatre with an audience of actual, live, human people. It's too much. I'm David Jays, and as the RAD has just moved into its purpose-built new home, we wanted to ask a dancer what it's like feeling at home and being far away. So Dame Monica Mason is the perfect guest. She spent most of her career at the Royal Ballet, as a ballerina, as a coach, as its artistic director. But she was born in South Africa, and having travelled to London in the 1950s to ignite her astonishing career, she kept travelling with the company. It's rare to get a chance to speak to someone who danced alongside Rudolf Nureyev and Marco Fontaine, and who journeyed through segregated America and behind the Iron Curtain, into hard-to-access countries like Cuba and China during times of political tension. As a vice president at the RAD, she has been a key figure in helping its dream of a new home become reality. Because home, a place to grow and welcome the world, is crucial to an arts organisation. Monica has a wisdom and a twinkle in her eye. She's a remarkable person and it's a privilege to listen to her because dance has been her life and she knows why it matters. Daniel Nicka Mason. Hello. Hello, David. Thank you. I wondered if we could just start with what was perhaps your first huge and decisive ballet journey, which was the one that took you from South Africa here to the UK. How old were you then? I came to England when I was 14. And uh, of course, in those days, people mostly came by boat, ship. So my mother and my sister younger sister and I sailed from Cape Town and it was actually the first time I'd ever been to Cape Town because I lived in Johannesburg which is a thousand miles away from the Cape so we took a train and it was the first time I'd ever been on a train and so we left Johannesburg and took a day and a night to get to Cape Town and then got on the ship. I couldn't wait and and quite a lot of friends and relatives had come to see us off I saw so many people in tears and I felt so guilty because I was jumping up and down for joy. I couldn't, I couldn't wait to come to England. I thought it was going to be so exciting and it's proved so. <laughs> and did you think this is a journey that's going to change my life? Did it have that sense of significance? I don't think I was able to think, you know, I don't know what other 14 year olds are like, but I was just so excited by the prospect of coming to London and being able to see ballet in a way I'd never seen it. You know, Sadler's Wells Theatre Ballet had visited Johannesburg in 1954. And uh, amongst the dancers in the company there were Kenneth Macmillan, Peter Wright. It was full of amazing people, yes. And, And my ballet teacher took me to a performance and my mother took me to a performance. And, of course, I stood at the stage door afterwards and got all their autographs in my little green autograph book. And then the idea that I would actually be able to come and see and be in a theatre, because apart from the Cape Town Ballet, which was considered semi-professional, part of the university degree course that they had in Cape Town, which was extraordinary for its time, and otherwise I'd really only ever seen Oklahoma and Annie Get Your Gun. And that was enough to fire me up because I just thought, 
if people can look as if they're having such a good time on the stage, I think I'd really like to do something like that. I, and of course, ballet was nothing like Oklahoma, but um, <laughs> but it was close. It was it was entertainment, you know. And you know, and then we arrived, and everything was extraordinary because we arrived in the middle of July, on a very chilly day, rainy, and on the train up from Southampton to London. Of course, I'd never seen chimney pots. See, we don't really have chimneys in London. And uh, we also don't have central heating. And so <laughs> it gets really cold in the winter. And uh, it was amazing to see rows and rows and rows of houses with chimney pots. And that was sort of the start of the adventure. I thought, I'm really somewhere different. And did you always think that this would be the place that you'd stay? Did it start to feel like you know, home I, quite quickly? I think I'm quite a day-by-day -day person. I don't think I kind of ever really made plans for where I might end up or what I might do. Uh, you know, I had a very practical mother, and, and then she married an Englishman, so I had a brand-new stepfather, and he was also very practical. And he informed me immediately that I was not going to be leaving school at the age of 14, even if I thought I might like to that I was going to go somewhere and do some O-levels. And so I did. I spent a year at a school run by Nesta Brooking. And then I went to the Royal Ballet School for a year, and then I joined the company. And I don't know what the first big trip you did with the company was, the first international tour. Would that have been to the States? Mm. Yes, yes. I mean, shortly after I joined, we went to the Edinburgh Festival. And that was wonderful because I suddenly I thought, well, I'm in Scotland. It was fun because it was the discovery of sharing, a, and in this case in Edinburgh, the digs were so awful. I was actually sharing a bed with a friend and we had got hysterics because the sheets were nylon sheets and we kept catching our toenails on the nylon sheets. So we giggled, we did lots of giggling. Uh, that was fun, but you know, to be in Edinburgh for the festival was to discover how many other organisations were there. It was such a buzzy place. There was so much going on. A couple of years later, I think, in fact, we set off for America in the September, and it was actually on my birthday. And I turned 19 on the day we flew to America. And that was, of course, extraordinary. You travelled by train across America? I we guess? did, yes, we did a five-month tour of America. So we started in New York for six weeks, and then we went the length and breadth, top and bottom, Canada, the south of the United States. I mean, it was, was amazing because I couldn't believe that I kept meeting people. For instance, meeting somebody in New York who'd never been to Los Angeles. And then the other way around, meeting people on the West Coast who'd never been East. But, you know, that was 1960. It was a long time ago. And people didn't travel like they do now. Of course, I discovered that a lot of Americans didn't have passports, which astonished me. I kind of drove it home what a, what a very privileged group of people we were, that we were going to make a tour like this. And, of course, different audiences everywhere. Tremendous amount of one-night stands, completely exhausting because no hotels. You just slept on the train and then you had to get off at 8 o'clock in the morning. And, of course, we were expected to dress properly at all times, you yeah, know. The gloves and... Well, they had the gloves, and, but the stockings with the seams straight up the back of the legs, um, which had to be climbed into on, in these sort of squeezy little restroom places on the train, I mean, with all of us falling over. And, and of course, you know, attaching your stockings. To, oh, I mean, it was all dreadful. <laughs> And and I, Monica, I have seen some like it hot. Yes. So I know exactly. That, I've got a very, very that, clear picture of that, your yes. train journeys. I'm imagining that parties exactly after lights how it was, out, yes. cocktails yes. being mixed in the hot water bottles. Tell me well, no, true. not cocktails. In the, we, we had little Dixie cups, they were called, that came out of a sort of a, a holder in the cloakroom areas where there was water, running water, it was sort of lukewarm. And the Dixie cups, they were pointy at the bottom, so you couldn't put them down, so you had to hold them. And, of course, that prompted you to... <laughs> so it was really, I think, it was on that tour that I discovered that I really liked whiskey. <laughs> it's important to make those discoveries. <laughs> yeah. And 
as we said, it's it, America was a huge country, a divided country at a particularly volatile moment yes. in the early 60s. Yes. And you, as you said, you traveled from the far north to the far south of the yes. country. Yes. Did it feel like going to totally different very, worlds from yes. one to the other? Very different worlds. I mean, you know, because first of all, being in New York was astonishing to, to stand in Times Square. And there was that huge billboard, I'm sure many people remember, where he's actually smoking and, and blowing smoke out of it. It was the most amazing ad. I'm pleased to say I was never tempted. But it, then, then, of course, contrast between New York and Chicago. And we were in Chicago for Christmas. It was freezing cold. Having to walk from the hotel to the theatre in minus 20 with a wind chill factor, I don't know what it was, and sort of having to keep going into doorways to sort of defrost your nose hairs. You know, it was freezing cold. And, uh, but amazing audiences, of course, they just... The Royal Ballet had made its first American tour in 1949, and then they went again in the 50s, I think three or four times before we did the 60-61 tour. So they already knew that they loved the Royal Ballet, and we were presented by... Sol Hurok, an amazing impresario who really knew what he was doing. And then, of course, the West Coast. Suddenly there were palm trees in Los Angeles. And, and to be staying in a hotel in Hollywood, we kept expecting to see movie stars everywhere, but we didn't. But they did come backstage. You know, when we were at the Shrine Auditorium, we performed there and at the Hollywood Bowl. I can remember Cary Grant coming to the Hollywood Bowl and coming backstage to see Margot Fontaine, of course. And then Danny Kaye, Judy Garland. You know, there were some big names, and, and that was astonishing. But then the South was, again, very, very different. I was sort of reminded of South Africa again because it was like apartheid in the South. We had a member of the orchestra, a violinist, lovely guy. He was black and he wasn't allowed to play in the orchestra in the South. He wasn't allowed to travel on the buses with us. And he wasn't allowed to eat with us. I remember writing home to my mother and saying, you know, this is like being in South Africa. It's horrible. And then, of course, through the 60s, we, we went many times and it could have got worse, really, because there were the assassinations President Kennedy was shot, and Martin Luther King. It was a tremendous eye-opener. I mean, I really think there's nothing like traveling for opening your eyes. And to be 19 and, and to discover the size of the United States. And at the same time, dancing our socks off, you know, night after night after night after night. It was like endless Swan Lakes and Giselles. Sleeping Beauty less so, but I do remember right at the very end of the tour being so exhausted and we came to a one, it was a one night stand and we moved into our dressing room and I remember saying to one of the girls, what are all these little, little black currants all over everywhere? And they went, oh, that's rats and mice. And <laughs> so somebody got a cloth. And we sort of swept them off onto the floor and then sat down and, you know, put on the makeup and got on with the show. So on the one hand, Judy Garland, on the other hand, pellets. <laughs> yeah, little pellets, yes. Yeah. And then later that year, I mean, we came back at the end of January. I think my mother was shocked. I was so thin because we'd worked so hard, you know, I mean. And then we went to Russia in the June for the first, and that was the first trip of the Royal Ballet to Russia. So we went to, first of all, St. Petersburg and then on to Moscow. It couldn't have been a greater contrast. Did you know what to expect? Because we're talking about a pre-internet age. You can't just sort of no. Google. There's much less imagery on for television. Did, did you have a strong idea in your mind about what it would be like? It's hard to remember, really. I mean, we had somebody from the Foreign Office come and talk to us about what to expect. I think we knew that it was not going to be like the States. I was very excited to be going again to such a very different place. When we got there, everything was so regimented and 
And the Foreign Office people had told us that we would all be followed at all times and that we were also under pain of death to make a comment about what we thought about the place. So we were told that we had to keep our opinions to ourselves, not even share them in the rooms, because they said everything will be bugged. Even in the bathroom, it will be bugged. And in fact, we did have people follow. I mean, I remember having somebody in who didn't even hide the fact that he was tailing us. And that was horrible. I mean, I really it was most uncomfortable. And then, uh, you know, one had these they've been described as sort of dragon women who sat on every floor of the hotel and monitored who was going into which room and we had to take our plugs with us bath plugs because they don't supply bath plugs and then of course you had to hide it it sounds awful but uh, you know it was such a shock to discover that people lived like this and they had so little and the food was terrible and it was minute portions and service after a performance. It was so slow, you know, and we would be sitting there absolutely feeling starving. I mean, rumbly tummies. I distinctly remember there was one enormous round table one night. Everybody said, oh, I'm so hungry. I wonder what, how long are they going to make us wait, you know? And sometimes it would be half an hour before anything appeared, not a glass of water, not a slice of bread, nothing. And then this exhausted looking waitress came to our table with a tray and on it was one plate of soup. <laughs> and she looked at the sort of 10 people around the table. You know, we were so tired, we just thought, well, whoever she puts it in front of, you know, just eat it. We'll just watch what you're eating and pray that we get one of, ours, uh, one of our own soon. I mean, it was horrible like that. But the audiences were absolutely amazing. People with such knowledge of, their, of this art form. And then, of course, the museums. I mean, being able to go to the Hermitage. And I felt terrible recently when somebody said to me, have you seen the Fabergé at the V&A? And I said, well, I've seen it in Russia. <laughs> <laughs> Mind you, many years ago. You know, and of course, to have the chance to go to those museums was absolutely extraordinary. St. Petersburg is such a beautiful city situated on the water the way it is. And, and again, the history of the theater and the school there, that was really quite, quite overwhelming in many ways. And then the wonderful women who dressed us and looked after us backstage in their white overalls, and who didn't speak a word of English, but there wasn't anything they wouldn't do for us. And they were expert at massaging calf muscles. And was there at any point during that trip a moment where you could have a, and as it were, a real conversation? No, not really. I mean, we, we, we just did as we were told and we didn't make any comments. I mean, we used to pull faces. We used to point at things and pull faces, but we didn't, we didn't criticize. We, you know, we were really on our best behavior. I think we were, we were made aware of the importance politically of the tour that we were going to make and a lot of very eminent Russian politicians came to performances and the Minister of Culture was a woman, I'm afraid I can't remember her name now, but she was very present and came on stage and there were speeches from the stage to the audience and we understood the importance of a trip like that. And of course, while we were there, Rudolf Nureyev was defecting in Paris at the same time. Of course, we heard nothing at all in Russia while we were there. Not a drop of news got out, and it was only when we came back that we discovered what had happened. And of course, Nureyev's first British performance was with the Royal Academy of Dance. Yes. To, uh, to gala that uh, Drury Lane yes. organised. Mm -hmm. So that's our rather lovely claim to fame in his yeah. story. In the years that followed, you worked with Nureyev a lot, Mikhail Barishnikov, Natalia Makarova, yeah. those other prominent dancers who left the Soviet Union. I'm wondering, Monica, if you've got a sense of what it means to a dancer to leave everything behind. You have an art that you can't take anywhere, but to know that you can't go back, mm. does that, do you think, 
settle somewhere in someone? It might be an impossible question. Well, I mean, I think that, you know, those kind of questions came up when one even thought of Kasavana, way back with Diaghilev and bringing his dancers out of Russia, some of them settling in the West, and, and of course, the teachers that made such an impression on everybody and in, influenced the, the RAD, uh, the Cicchetti influences. Uh, you know, that was for all of us in the company. I mean, when I joined in 58, one of the first ballets was Firebird. And to discover that the people who came to rehearse us were the ballet master and the ballet mistress from the Diaghilev Ballet. And when they used to say, no, no, Mr. Fokin, he liked it like this. You know, and you'd sort of open your eyes and think, did I really hear what I thought I heard? You know, what an incredible link. And then, of course, those Russians who settled in England, they left everything. Then it just seemed as if history repeated itself when it was Rudolf. And then, of course, Rudolf was hounded by the KGB. He was followed everywhere around London. Everywhere he went, he knew that there was a car behind or when he went in a restaurant, there was somebody at a table nearby. There were moments when we thought he was being paranoid until we actually saw them and realized. And he would come out of the stage door and he would know that there was somebody standing on the other side of the street who was observing where he went and who he was with. And I think he was terrified a lot of the time. He thought he would be snatched and kidnapped and sent back or something terrible would happen. And so then, of course, with Baryshnikov and then later on Makarova, the same thing. You know, these people left everything. Knowing what I'd felt like when I went on my American tour, but knowing that we were coming home afterwards. And these people had risked everything. The panoffs when we campaign to get the panoffs to be allowed to stay here. And I think the influence that they've all had on us is enormous. And of course now we sort of take it for granted that we're such an, an incredibly global world and our art form is global too. So that the exchange of ideas and thoughts and, and ballets and styles, you know, it, it's not at all what it was when I first came to England, where we were, um, the Royal Ballet was the Royal Ballet in England, and it was only just the beginning of venturing forth and showing the world what we really were. I mean, 1975, we went to Japan for the first time. We started, actually went to Korea first. And I mean, when we were in Korea, we'd got a, we were only there, I think, for two performances, and we'd got a mixed bill and one of the, uh, it was Kenneth Macmillan was directing then, and he wanted to show part of his ballet concerto with the pas de deux from the second movement. And of course the music is Shostakovich. And we got a message back saying, Shostakovich is not allowed to be played in South Korea because it's Russian. And so uh, we thought, oh, just as well, we didn't plan to do Swan Lake. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, Anyway, finally, we got permission. And again, you see, the audience response was they were hearing Shostakovich for the first time since the Korean War, since before the Korean War. You know, and there are landmarks like that. Going to Japan was so extraordinary because the Japanese, of course, had never really seen, well, they hadn't seen the Royal Ballet. They'd really not seen very much in the way of classical ballet at all. They hadn't seen our repertoire at all. They were very anxious about being seen to be applauding in the right places. So the easiest thing was not to applaud. So they, the, the tiny little clappings happened, very, very polite. And, but you could see the faces and they were so eager and everything. But the clapping was very minimal. And then, of course, we went back and gradually, and now, of course, they're one of the most wonderful places to go to perform. And then China. 83, we went to China for the first time. That was also astonishing because it was, Beijing was two stories high, everything. People lived in tents on the street. People relied on a sort of center point for where they'd get their buckets of water from, 
one big tap. Again, it reminded me of being back in Africa. And, and then, of course, as we went back, more and more, up went the buildings, motorways came, and in fact, we were there. I think my last time in China was 2008 for the Olympics, and that was extraordinary. And at that point, they must have felt like a, a wholly different city and a wholly different country. Because the amount of construction, the amount of activity, and the amount of being more open to the, to the yes. rest must have changed yes. beyond recognition. Yes. I always remember prior to 2008, I think it was somewhere in the 90s, each time we went to Beijing, we performed in a different venue. And on this occasion, we were in a, I don't know what how to describe it. It, it, it had a stage and it had seating and that was about all. It seemed that they had no way of controlling how many people came into the theater. And so people had tickets, but four girls, four young girls, giggly, would have one ticket before. And then they'd all, four of them, sit on one seat. They'd sit on top of each other. And I remember the, the opening night there was Sylvie Guillem and we were doing Romeo and Juliet. And Anthony Dahl and I went out front and we sat down in the audience. And, and suddenly Anthony said, oh, don't look now, Mon, but the front row... And the front row was entirely photographers with lenses this long. And I thought they're going to practically touch the stage. And Sylvie is allergic to photographers and so picky about what anybody was allowed to see from photographs. I went backstage and got an interpreter and they came out and explained to the photographers that they were not allowed to take photographs during the performance and so they all put their cameras underneath the seat and they all sat there then the moment the show started out came the cameras <laughs> and of course when it came to the first interval Anthony said to me I don't know how to face Sylvie what are we going to say I said well let's just go back and see how she's feeling and we went back and of course we were so nervous she didn't have a dressing room she had a corner of the wings with a curtain round it and we pulled it and our two little faces went and we went, Sylvie? And she went, come in, come in. And we said, are you okay? We're concerned about the photographers. And she went, you know, she just accepted it and thank God she did. Otherwise, I, I kept thinking she's going to walk off the stage, but she didn't, she stayed. It does sound when you're talking about these experiences as if those performances were quite emotionally charged it's not, they don't feel at all like a routine run of the mill. No, you know, it was all discoveries, you know, and the same thing applied when we went for the first time to Cuba in 09. I mean, you know, that's not that long ago now. Again, it was the first time the Royal Ballet had been to Cuba. Carlos Acosta, of course, really wanted the tour to happen. Alicia Alonso was still alive, and we had to have very much her blessing in order to be there. Again, people steeped in the arts. And how do, do those experiences change you as an artist? Because in dance, a lot of the work is done in <laughs> with donor studios, mm. uh, you know, which in a sense could be anywhere. So when you take the work out into the world, does that sort of recalibrate you? I think, I think you know, it, you appreciate what you have more and more. I think that watching Ninette de Valois speaking to an audience of dance teachers or critics in Russia on our first tour, and then watching her speak at a dance school where she'd, you know, she took us, she made us go everywhere. I mean, there were, it didn't matter that we'd had a performance the night before. She'd got a bus ready at nine o'clock the next morning. She said, you can do class before the performance and we don't have to rehearse anything because, you know, that's the rep, but we're going to go to this museum and that museum and we're going to this dance school and that dance. She took us and everywhere she went, she spoke. I never heard her say the same thing twice. And I just thought, this woman, I know she's, got a reputation, enormous. But now I'm witnessing what she's really like because she was someone you know, who terrified me when I was first a member of the company. I was so worried I'd be sacked because I'd do something wrong and she'd sack me. And in those days, you could do that. You just got rid of people if you didn't want them. And she just frightened me so much. 
She was seemed so powerful. But then when I heard her speak about the things she cared about and what we represented and what it meant to her to bring us to Russia, because of course she danced with Diaghilev's company in the Valley Rus, and so she'd, she'd known the Russians since the 20s. And of course she said that that was the lessons she learned from Diaghilev were the things that she treasured when she came to make the Royal Ballet to try to found a company in the UK. When he found yourself in that, exactly that position of the head of the Royal Ballet, running the company, how did you make it feel like a home for all the people who were working in the company on stage and off? It was very fortunate because rather like this wonderful building now, we had taken delivery of our new home at the Opera House in 1999, in the November. We managed to scrape in just before the, the new year. And, and so for the first time, the Royal Ballet actually was going to be housed at the Royal Opera House. And we had our own dressing rooms. Previously, we'd always shared our dressing rooms with the opera. So everything always had to be put away in lockers after every single show. You packed everything up and put it in a locker because the next night there'd be singers in the dressing room. And so it felt temporary and we had, didn't have any studios that we could really call our own at the Opera House. Those were on the other side of London, weren't they? The they we were in West London, been. yes, by the, in the ballet school. And so when we moved in and then Suddenly it was the new year and it was the year 2000. And there we were. And then two years later, when Ross Stretton wasn't well and he stepped down and I was asked to caretake for a while. Um, and then the caretaking turned into the real thing. You know, it was sort of unbelievable to me because I'd, I'd actually never aspired to be a director. I'd aspired to be the best assistant director in the whole world because I'd assisted Kenneth Macmillan and I assisted Anthony Dowell and I assisted Norman Morris to an extent. And that was how I identified myself. And then suddenly to be told by one of the members of the board that I had to move out of my tiny little office that didn't have a window out to the real world that I had to move into the director's office. They said, you're, even if you're caretaking for six weeks, you're going to need to have meetings, you need space, you can't have anybody in this little box. So I moved into the director's office feeling that was imposter syndrome then. And I thought, no, no, I, this is not really, this, I shouldn't be in here, this is not right. And then suddenly, having spent so many years, when people, dancers would ask me something, I'd say, oh, I'll ask Kenneth for you. I'll, Oh, no, I'll ask Anthony. No, I'll ask Norman. You know, Suddenly, somebody asked me a question, and I thought, actually, what do I think? This is me. I've got to answer this now. This is where the buck stops. So it was extraordinary. And I think that it was the fact that we'd now got this wonderful new home, that it was, it, it sort of followed naturally that I would feel that I was now heading this amazing organization. And I wanted, I so wanted not to fail. I so wanted to, to be able to support all those dancers, you know, 90 of them, trying to look after all of them and, and make them, most of them happy most of the time. The wonderful opportunity of being able to create programs, to have a theme for a triple bill and sort it out and then commission people to choreograph. I mean, it's the most incredible privilege. And it's such a wonderful organization, such a, the Opera House is a, a most wonderful place to work because everybody in the place is working towards one thing, and that's the show. So that every department in the house just pulls together to make those shows work. You know, in, in extreme emergencies, costume departments, prop departments, everybody just kind of drops everything and says, we'll make it work, don't worry. We'll, we'll get there, we'll be there on the night. And so you become more and more aware, especially, I mean, having been there many years as a dancer and not really understanding that, it was sort of unspoken, you know, but when you're actually heading it, 
you realize how incredible everybody is who works there, that they will do anything to make that show happen. We do often hear dancers talk about their company as a family. Mm. And I'm wondering, does, is, is that sentiment or is that how it feels to you? No, I think it does feel like that because you spend so much time together. You get to know one another so well. You share so much. You know, you share your fears and your triumphs and, and the work, the daily, daily work. These are the people, often people say, you know, I spend more time in the rehearsal studio with the dancers than I do with my husband or my wife or my partner, you know, because this is where it's at, you know, and, and it takes all those hours and that amount of dedication to keep it like that. I think the same applies, though, to English National Ballet. You know, that's a company that I've always thought we've known dancers there. I've worked with them on occasions. And that's an incredible family. It's a slightly smaller family, but one that travels enormously. You know, when Beryl Gray was running the company and stories of her tours in Europe, because they did a lot of touring in Europe. And again, some of her stories of standing, I mean, she told a wonderful story once when there was a huge problem, financial problem, and she was wanting to contact the chairman. Um, and she was somewhere, maybe France or Italy, on a street corner in a public call box. And she couldn't get the money to work. <laughs> and then when she got the money in, and then she, the line went dead. And, and of course, the idea today of a director having to stand in a public call box to try and <laughs> reach the chairman. I mean, uh, you know, I think she, Beryl, is such an approachable person. And as a dancer, she was wonderful because she was a huge inspiration to younger dancers because she was so accessible. And, uh, and then I think when she ran ENB, I mean, she was, she loved being Mother Hen and looking after all her little chicks. And, and that, that, that role for her was so important. And she was like that. She was such a mother figure. And uh, so I think, and then Sadler's Wells uh, Royal Ballet, you know, even before they went to Birmingham, you know, knowing that company well and performing with them, it was another family. So I think people, you know, here now at the RAD, I think in this wonderful new building, people will feel like it's a family here because uh, having achieved this wonderful place and now also being on the brink of taking it into the next hundred years and w what that's going to mean to everybody. How do we go about it? How differently can we do everything? And then, of course, people coming from around the world to see the building, to appreciate it. I think, you know, I think there's something wonderful in, we like families, don't we? We like being all joined up. You were very much involved in the fundraising for um, the new building. And I'm wondering what, when you were faced with someone who was a little reluctant to open their wallet, um, when you had to make an argument for why the, the new building was important and what it would mean, what was the strongest argument in your quiver? It's my belief in what it gives the world, the importance of young people understanding, appreciating, being well taught, being properly prepared for whatever is going to be their career, whether it's teaching or dancing or something else entirely, but that dance influences them, that the ability to um, communicate, to care deeply about something is so vital. We are almost out of time. I'm just going to ask one final question, Monica, are if you? I may, because we're recording this conversation as well for the RAD podcast, which is called Why Dance Matters. And so I wondered why dance matters to you? I think that having traveled the world with, as I've done so fortunately, the great thing about dance is that there is no language. The language, the dance is the language. And so it's taken us to so many, many places where you can't really communicate 
with people. I mean, our first tour to Japan, our first tour to China, our first time, the first time we went to Russia, and then Brazil and Cuba and, you know, and then all around Europe too. Uh, the great thing is that people come, they want to watch, they seem to understand, they get something from it. And so, you know, it, the language of dance is what sells it. And, and so I think it's been such a privilege to be a part of an art form that doesn't need language and that people can come, enjoy the music. And maybe not everybody decides on that occasion. I can't wait to see the next performance. Maybe somebody's going to sit there and say, well, I've seen ballet now. <laughs> That's also fine. But I think it is, you know, it's such, it has such an international reach. And, and, and I think that's been the great thing, is taking it all around the world and discovering that people everywhere seem to understand. Monica, it has been an absolute privilege to travel the world with you for the last hour. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. May you live in interesting times, may be an ancient curse, but how amazing to hear Monica describe her voyage through some of the more interesting moments and places of the 20th century. Dance, as she describes it, is about much more than a performance on a stage. It's something that takes you to places that you'd never otherwise access, lets you taste and feel and experience the world. Let us know what you think. I'm at Mr. David Jays on Twitter, and the RAD is at RAD Headquarters. And you can explore its work and its new home via our show notes. Our guest today was Dame Monica Mason. Why Dance Matters is made by the RAD team of Sarah Jane Lewis, Celia Moran, Melanie Murphy, and Charlie Strachan. And our artwork is by Bex Glendening. And our real, live, human producer is Sarah Miles. I'm David Jays. Take care and see you soon.